Right Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, you asked me what the way forward was. I thought you were going to tell us. I feel uh, <laughs> devastatedly put on the spot. Um, before I say anything, I just want to say a word about what Zach said because um, I, I took something really specific and important from it that I want us all to remember. Um, Statewide elections, when they're close, are won or lost in the suburbs. If you look throughout that presentation, throughout that presentation, there was example after example after example that shows that the suburbs swing back and forth more than any other part of the state. We have an incredible responsibility and opportunity right here. And I mention that not just to get people motivated, though if you're motivated, I don't mind. <laughs> I mention that because I think a lot of us are coming out to events all the time these days, and the question I get very often is, I'm so mad at Trump and what's being done at the federal level, and yeah, it's nice that my federal representatives, Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth and Brad Schneider and Jan Schakowsky are all on the right side, but what does that leave me able to do? I've got nobody to persuade, I've got nobody to convince. What do I do? And the answer is that we have an unbelievable opportunity to have a tremendous impact on statewide elections right here, an outsized opportunity, an opportunity greater than what you would see um, 12 miles southeast of here, right? If you go 12 miles southeast of here and look at how much those election returns vary from year to year, it's, it's somewhat, it matters but it's much less than the variance here that we control. And so we may not be able to call our member of Congress and flip them from a bad vote, but we can call our friends and flip them from a bad vote. We can call our neighbors and flip them from a bad vote. We have people who vote with us a lot of the time, for sure voted for Hillary Clinton, almost certainly voted for Dick Durbin, and think like us on many issues, but voted for Bruce Rauner in 2014. There's a lot of folks like that in Northfield Township, a lot. And that presents us with an incredible opportunity going into 2018. Now, I have some interest in the governor's race. Um, you have some interest in getting out of here. So I'm gonna to try to keep this extremely short, but then I'll be holding the mic and I'll open up for, for questions unless Dan or Mike get really angry at me. But I just wanna to say to very brief things about my sense of the moment that we're in and the responsibility that we have and the opportunity that we had and, and what it is about that sense that convinced me to run for governor. And then if you want to ask specific questions, I'm happy to go there too. But there's, there's two things going on. The first is one that Laura explained unbelievably clearly and poignantly, and that is they, the, I'm gonna mix a lot of metaphors right in a row, the train wreck dumpster fire, <laughs> car accident that's happening in Springfield. And it's awful. And it's harmful. And it's destructive. And it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of life and death. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody convince you that it's just politics. Because when you shut down social service agencies, take away mental health services and substance abuse treatment, get rid of homeless shelters, and then act confused about why the murder rate's gone up, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. So this is a matter of life and death. It's a matter of expelling people from the state if they are trying to get a higher education and can afford to leave the state. And it's about expelling people from having that opportunity if they're trying to get a higher education and can't afford to leave the state. So this is serious, serious business. No other state is going through anything like this. To my knowledge, no other state ever has. And it's got to stop. The other thing to say, though, is that when Bruce Rauner took office in 2015, before this crisis happened, before we shut down all of these service providers, things were then not exactly perfect in the state of Illinois. <laughs> there were severe problems, and those problems were a result of decades of broken politics and decades of a machine system that was not working for most of us, a system where decisions were made in a closed room with locked doors, and we weren't in there, and the results are being felt today. And so the question that I ask myself isn't just, how do you stop Bruce Rauner from being governor doing these awful things? 
It's how you transform our political system so that decisions are made on behalf of all of us, not on behalf of a few. Whether it's a political machine or a billionaire or anybody else, the point isn't which one is it. The point is, it, why is it for one pure person or a few people rather than for the rest of us? So that's the situation that we find ourselves in. The other situation we find ourselves in is one of unparalleled activism happening across the state. When Elaine talked about how this meeting might have happened in a, I won't say phone booth, but much smaller room not too long ago, that's true and it's exciting. And thank you for being here, and I appreciate it, and I am moved by it, but guess what, guys? You're not so special. It's happening all over the state of Illinois. <laughs> all over the state of Illinois, turnouts are bigger than before. People are looking to be active. People sense the importance of the mo moment, the urgency, and the need. There's a hunger to act. And a lot of that is because of Donald Trump, with damn good reason. <laughs> But there's a lot of connections between the threats coming at us from the federal level and the need that we're experiencing on the state level. And there's connections that are specific about policies, particularly through the Affordable Care Act, particularly through Governor Rauner's reprehensible and grotesque threat to veto House Bill 40 that Laura mentioned. This is a bill to protect women's reproductive freedom from the Donald Trump Supreme Court and Bruce Rauner has threatened to veto it, siding with Donald Trump against Illinois women. It comes to our efforts to protect immigrants and refugees. There are numerous specific policy connections, but there's also basic kind of what side are you on connections. So the last big moment of protest and activism I was involved in was uh, downtown at Daily Plaza on Saturday uh, for the tax march. I don't know if anybody here was there. Awesome, thank you for being there. Uh, <laughs> I was there too, and so were thousands of other people, and it was a protest to demand that Donald Trump release his tax returns. And I've been making a lot of this. Uh, I introduced a bill in the beginning of the session saying that you can't appear on the ballot for president in Illinois unless you've released five years of your tax returns. And I also released my own tax returns uh, once I finished them, <laughs> which was annoying, but uh, hooray for TurboTax. Uh, and, the fundamental question is what, why? why? Why is this something important to talk about? The question is what motivates the people who are responsible for our governmental decisions? And in the case of Donald Trump, it's really crazy obvious, which is why there's so much passion around the interest in seeing what's in his tax returns, because it connects to basic conflicts of interest that even go as far as foreign policy. It's a very scary thing for our country. But the, the underlying question is, what brings you into public service and what vision of governance do you have? Is it one of helping yourself? Or is it one of helping a few people? Or is it one of empowering people across the state to help themselves and strengthen their own communities and neighborhoods? And that is what I see as being on the ballot in this election. And that is the opportunity that I see in this election that, quite frankly, I haven't seen before in Illinois because there wasn't this volume of activism and this culture of protest and civic engagement. And so the question that I think is facing all of us is, how can we harness this hunger and turn it into a movement to take our state government back? How can we harness this hunger and organize it around a progressive vision for how to fix Illinois? How can we connect this desire to have uh, social and economic justice expressed at the federal level, also be expressed in a desire for fair taxation, proper school funding, and provision of services on the state level that actually enable us to invest in every single neighborhood in Illinois, and finally allow people in every part of Illinois to realize their potential. And I see that opportunity before us now, and that's why I'm running for governor. And so, no, don't, don't laugh. <laughs> and there's a lot to do between today and the March primary and then the, the November election to realize that vision. And if we successfully do those things, build that grassroots movement, win those elections, put me in office, <laughs> then we will have, then we will have, Thank you, but then we will have just gotten started with the hard part. Then we will have just begun doing the really difficult work. Then we will find ourselves with huge 
technical problems, huge fiscal problems, huge economic problems, and a need to all continue to stay mobilized in support of progressive efforts to solve those problems. And that long-term plan, yes, a primary election, yes, a general election, but then a movement of people prepared to demand state policies that work for all of us is what brought me into this race. So I don't know if someone's gonna grab the mic for me, but if no one grabs the mic for me, and if anyone has questions or suggestions, I'm eager to hear questions and also suggestions. Debbie. Can we just endorse you now? Yes. Can we do it? Affirmation, what? Can I get some membership dues first? If anyone else has questions just like Debbie's, <laughs> otherwise I think there's uh, something else on the program. Um, so I've been a supporter of yours since I first heard you. Uh, you had a town meeting when you were a freshman, uh, you know, Senator, and, you, and I'm a retired school librarian, but at the time I wasn't retired. And you talked about pensions, and, which is a big concern. So I was thrilled when you announced, and I've been talking to a lot of my friends, and I have a number of friends who say, yeah, but um, we need a millionaire or a billionaire to fight a millionaire. And so I'd like to know if you could kind of address that concern. Yeah, thank you. Did everybody hear the question in the back? Yeah. Okay. I would say um, a few things on this. I would fundamentally start here. What is this democracy we have? What is this system we have? How is it gonna work? And if the answer is that we have to pick the richest person and make them governor or president, then we're done. We can't accept that. We cannot accept that. And by the way, if we happen to have a billionaire as a Democrat who's a nice guy this time, and we can sort of lurch through this one election and find a billionaire who's okay, as long as the system is who's got more billionaires on their side, we're in a lot of trouble. So, so I think that if we have to accept that, we've got so many other problems on our hands that I, I don't even know what to make of that. But so let me, let me say why on a more practical level, I don't accept that. Number one, contrast matters. We need a candidate who's going to look different than Rauner, seem different than Rauner, appeal to people for different reasons than Rauner, present a strong contrast. That contrast is gonna be needed to get people out to vote. You saw Zach's presentation about how badly we did in terms of turning out our base in 2014. I think if our message in 2018 is hey, our version of Rauner is better than the original, it's gonna be hard to use that as a, an exciting message to turn people out. That's number one. Number two, here's how fundraising for Democratic campaigns has historically worked on the state level in Illinois. There's a fixed pot of money out there, a fixed set of interests and individuals who are used to giving, and they give what they give, it's in their budget, and that's all they have, and then when they're done, they're done. And in that world, if somebody comes in on the other side and writes a giant check that's never been heard of before, it's terrifying, because how do you compete with that? But here's how fundraising works, not just on the presidential level for Bernie Sanders and Barack Obama and Howard Dean, but for Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth and Jan Schakowsky and Brad Schneider and Robin Kelly and Bill Foster and Sherry Bustos. They motivate people who are aligned with their vision and those people feel compelled to make contributions. And the more excited people feel and the larger number of people who share their vision and see that their own lives can be improved by that candidate winning, the more successful their fundraising becomes. We've not done that on the state level because of old, ugly habits, frankly. But we should. Not just because it would help us raise money and win elections, but because raising money and winning elections by appealing to a huge number of people ensures that our policies will be aligned with what's right for the community. And so I think this is the moment right now with people marching in the streets, with community rooms full across the state, to have a campaign that funds itself by appealing to people. In the first 10 days of the campaign, I had over a thousand contributions, most of them small contributions, most of them I was kind of uh, moved and stunned to realize were for people I'd never met before, people all across the state of Illinois. That wasn't enough to go up against a billionaire, but it was a start that showed me that there's an extraordinary hunger out there. 
I think we have to develop that model of fundraising that relies on empowering people, engaging people, motivating people, and then giving those people a chance to have a stake in a campaign. If we do that right, we not only will raise the money that we need to win, we'll already have the people on our side that are the most important part of winning. Because after all, you win elections by getting more votes than somebody else. The money is a tool. The actual goal is to get the votes. And if you get the votes and the money by empowering and motivating people in the first place, you've really cut out the middle now. Jason. Just um, as, a, as a piece of advice. Sorry, I should have said trustee. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, as a piece of advice, I've lived in Champaign, I've lived in Bloomington, I've lived in Belleville. Um, Central Illinoisans hate it when you call them downstate. You know, if you, if you take Illinois, Illinois is a very long state. If you fold it in half, Bloomington is actually above the fold. So, yeah. so um, <laughs> don't make the mistake of calling anybody south of I-80 downstate. Make sure you really are downstate. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's not just about the fold and the paper. It's, I mean, Illinois is a giant place, and it's got a number of culturally distinct areas. And quite frankly, in a lot of ways, Peoria is more culturally similar to Chicago than it is to Marion. And so if you, it is, it is as a matter of political uh, numerology, just fine to break up the state into large groups and look at the numbers. But when you're talking to people, you have to talk to people as people. And when you seek to show respect for community, you can't pretend that Rockford and Cairo are the same because they're both outside the Chicago media market. Uh, and if you treat people as though those two places are the same, that's disrespectful and no one's gonna vote for you. What this campaign needs to be about is not only being everywhere, but listening everywhere, and most importantly, respecting people everywhere. If you were governor, would you still support the uh, can bargain? And you get the answer. Uh, so the question was, if I were governor, would I support the grand bargain? Um, the answer is, that's an easy question, no. Uh, the grand bargain is a noble effort to produce a compromise with an unreasonable person. Uh, Bruce Rauner has said, I'm going to hold the state hostage unless you do all these other things. And the grand bargain is an effort to say, listen, that's obnoxious and dishonest and ridiculous, but in order to stop the state from bleeding, hey, let's try to see if we can come up with a deal. And so whether you're for it or against it, it's a something you would reluctantly come to, given who we're dealing with. The whole point of electing someone else governor is to not have to do that. The right answer is to fix the budget. And yes, there are structural problems that need to be addressed, many of them, but anybody who would say that we're gonna fix the state's problems by holding the budget hostage, by harming the homeless, by shutting down social service providers, by making it unclear whether schools are gonna open next fall, or even in some cases whether schools will still be open until the end of this school year, and by driving students seeking community college or university education out of state. Anyone who'd say that that's the way to fix the budget is really about their own ego, not about the state of Illinois. Right. So, the night after doomsday, um, when I was on the ledge preparing to jump. This is the night of November 9th? Correct. Yeah. Um, that night. I became aware of Indivisible Guide. Yep. And since then, it has gone from something I downloaded and pointed to and said yes to over 5,800 separate groups mushrooming, mushrooming up everywhere. Yeah. Is something being done by traditional democratic organizations to tap in, to partner with that upsurge of just people probably never having been involved at all now becoming involved for the first time yeah. uh, it seems like a tidal wave yeah. that is a wonderful opportunity yeah so there are three ways that a democratic organization could respond to this as you put it accurately tidal wave of activism and by the way the indivisible umbrella is a giant umbrella of lots of different groups and it's actually just one of many different umbrellas right. like the action for better tomorrow umbrella and, and so on and so forth and this is very 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 um, exciting so there's three ways that the Democratic Party might re react to this um, spoiler alert there's two wrong ways and one right way <laughs> one wrong way is to say hey you guys would be nice volunteers let's appropriate you, we're gonna tell you what to do. Come over here, we're the professionals, you're the kids, and just start taking orders. Another wrong way is to say, sorry, what, huh? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean. And the right way is to say, 
I see what you're doing. That's awesome. You tell me how I can help you. If you have questions, I'm here to answer them. I have lots of events that are probably well aligned with your philosophy. You should come to those too if you're interested. And we should become partners and allies, and we'll probably find ourselves aligned about 98% of the time. Oh, by the way, one of those times we will be aligned is when general elections come along. And if we all continue to be working together, communicating well, growing and nurturing each other's development, then by the time the November of 2018 election comes along, we will be unstoppable. And quite frankly, among uh, kind of institutional Democrats in Illinois, you see all three of these approaches. It certainly including column three, certainly including people who are getting it right. The thesis of my campaign is that, if, is that the, the most fundamental uh, decision facing the Democratic Party is that one, is how do we do that right? How do we say to all of these new activists, thank you, congratulations, we want to help you, we want to grow this movement, we want to be as inclusive as possible, we want to be as open as possible, and we want to make sure that all of us are linking arms and marching forward and being successful in 2018. I was a little surprised, for example, that I was the only gubernatorial candidate at the tax march on yeah. Saturday. I mean, to me, that was thousands and thousands and thousands of exactly the sort of person that anyone who wants to be a Democratic nominee for governor of Illinois ought to be standing with. Uh, and I, 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 that was a meaningful moment for me. Um, I know that some of the other candidates do also see the importance of this new activism, but, but I, I think it's really crucial if we want to be successful, again, not just as a campaign in November, but as a force to transform the Democratic Party in the state in a good way, that we be as inclusive and welcoming as possible and make sure that we help the leaders in these new movements achieve their goal, which is to make sure that they are twice as strong in six months as they are now. And if they are, that's great news for progressives in Congress, it's bad news for Donald Trump's legislative agenda, and it's great news for Democrats across the country. I think, uh, okay. Thank you very much.